guys for a second. All right, so welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And for anyone whose first time it is joining us here today, um, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants is all about bringing adventure, science, and conservation into the classrooms around the world. So today we are joined right now uh, by two classes. So we're just going to unmute you guys, and you guys can give us a nice hello. hello. So you guys can yell as long as you yell, yell. <laughs> So the both classes that we have are both from Ontario, which is great. we got locals, and hopefully we'll have some American classes joining us soon enough. Uh, but the reason that we are all here today is to see Ajana here. So Ajana Costa, she is part of the National Geographic Okavano Wilderness Project. It is, it is a multi-year research and conservation project to help document and protect uh, our planet's last wetland wilderness. And so the Okavana Delta is home to an incredible amount of biodiversity of species, and a lot of them are threatened. So the Delta itself is protected, but the headwaters in Angola and Nambia are not. So Ajana, she is the assistant director of the project, uh, and she's an Angolian scientist with her master's in environmental science. So as an ichthyologist, she is an expert of the fish survey team and the local liaison between the team and the Angolian government. So we are thrilled to be joined by you, Ajana. So I'll just take it away. It's all you from here. Thank you, Lucia. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, like Lucia said, my name is Ajani. I'm from Angola, which is somewhere in Africa, in the west coast of Africa. Um, and I've joined the National Geographic team that has been exploring the Okavango over the past year. So most people know where the delta is, the Okavango Delta is. It's in Botswana and it's very famous. There's a lot of biodiversity. People visit it all the time. But most people do not know where the water goes to the delta come from. So it starts in Angola, and everything that happens in Angola will have consequences and influence all the way throughout in Namibia and in Botswana. So last year, this team of 15 scientists, which I was a part of, decided to go through the whole system from Angola through Namibia all the way to the delta in a Mokoro, which is a dugout canoe. So we were there paddling for eight hours a day for four months in the wilderness, trying to figure out what are the influences, um, the human influences over the system, and what we can do to help the biodiversity and the wilderness in general to uh, prosper. So how can we protect it? How can we do conservation in an area that no one knows of? So I'm an ichthyologist, so I study the fish. So my job was to describe all the fish that we encountered throughout the way while we had other people describing the birds some people describing the mammals we had people for plants we even had people to uh, monitor the water quality what we're doing now is to compile all the information so we can see how can we protect this environment and how we can bring people from everywhere around the world to help us protect this environment as well so far we've come to 30 new species to science, so it's species that no one has ever seen before. We, has, we still have wild dogs, cheetahs, elephants, lions, pretty much every big mammal that you can think of that um, occurs in this area, which we believe to be extinct in this part. We have very, very pristine forest pieces, which is a very big plus. And we're now also working with communities, so we can show them alternatives to their livelihoods that cut their negative impact to their surrounding environments. So right now I'm in Angola. I just come, came back um, from one of expeditions. So I live in the capital. The expedition was in a province called Mushiku in the east of the country. And we stayed there for two months and we had people bicycling around the forest. We had people taking drone shots from the top. We had people um, surveying the soil. So we came out with a lot of data and now everyone has gone home to look at the data and see what we can learn even more and what we can propose to the government and to the people in general, what we can do from now on. And now um, I'll pass it on to you, Lucia. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so you have a presentation ready to talking about your research or anything? Sorry, can't hear you properly? 
Um, Joe said that you have a presentation ready, or we can just talk about questions that we have. Um, uh, we, sorry, go we ahead. Can go, we can go straight to questions because I wasn't able to upload the presentation because it's okay. too big. All right, that's that's okay. Um, so when did the Okavano get started, and what exactly are all the goals that you have? Okay, so technically the Okavango project, the base of the Okavango project started 10 years ago with Dr. Steve Boyce and his brother Chris Boyce and they only studied the delta of the Okavango, so only birds. They were looking at birds and see how they changed and how it influenced the environment. Um, then they realized there was a problem, so they decided to come all the way to Angola. And that happened last year in 2015. So the Okavango Wilderness Project itself, the name came um, in September last year. And we have a goal to go until 2018 so far. The main goal is to describe the entire biodiversity and to come up with conservation plans for the area so we don't lose the massive biodiversity that we have there. Um, the specific goals we have now is to propose a new protected area to the Angolan government that is one of the largest parks that would exist in this region of Africa. And with that, you would have connectivity all the way to the Delta, and so we can extend the UNESCO heritage site that the Delta is all the way up to the source. Awesome, that sounds great. Um, now, how do you travel through the like through a wetland? Like, do you have a speedboat? Do you use a canoe? Like, how do you go through? Yeah, people call us a little bit crazy. <laughs> we go through dugout canoes, which we call Mokoro. Uh, we have a person in front and a person in the back, and we paddle. We literally paddle the river all the way down. We just follow the flow and we paddle. And usually our expeditions take two to four months because we do very limited um, uh, distances throughout the day because we is not as easy as driving. <laughs> Sorry, there you go. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, sorry, it was just feedback from one of the classes. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, so we paddle, which is very little distances throughout the day. Uh, of course, to go to the, to the sources or to the rivers, we have to drive, sometimes very long drives because we don't have roads. We have to cut open paths to the for through the forests and through the grasslands. Um, but in the river, we use canoes. That's awesome. Um, now, as an ichthyologist, a fish person, what kind of fish are you finding or looking for in the delta? Uh, in the Delta, the Delta is very well known, but of course, you still have a few very rare species. You have some, well, we call it cichlids, which is like a big fat fish. <laughs> that is very, though it's very big, it is very rare and it's really, really beautiful because it has orange um, oval spots in the fins and it's called the thin face um, Theonochromus. And I love that fish. But in Angola and in Namibia, it's very difficult to choose a species because we've been finding so many new species, species that we've never seen before, that we're always very anxious to see what's coming up in the next net because it might be something new. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite species that you love seeing? Favorite species that I love seeing uh, would be, well, it's not, it's not a very common favorite species. <laughs> But it is, it is called the no pelvic catfish. It is a new species, but it's very funny because it only walk, it doesn't walk, but it doesn't swim. It just slides through the mud, and so it doesn't have some of the fins that most fish do have. So it has a very funny way to move around the mud. That's great. So why do you think you're finding so many new species in the Okavango? Uh. There has never been anyone researching this area before. We are the first people to do the research throughout the full length of the system. You do have some very specific spots where people can go and fish um, towards uh, the southern part of the system, but the heads, the sources are completely unknown. So we are the only ones that 
started this research um, project in this area. So it's it's easy to find new species if no one has ever been there before. Uh, then we have one question over Twitter asking, how do you spell the name of the fish with the orange spots that you just mentioned? The same way? <laughs> so you can call it the thin face um, largemouth. I think it's easier. Largemouth. Large. Um, thin T H I N. Okay. Thin, thin face. face. Large mouth. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Good. That's a great question. Um, now, when you're looking for the fish, do you tag them? Do you just catch them in nets and identify them? Like, how are you keeping track of all these guys? Um, so we use different techniques to catch different fish. So we have different types of nets. You have nets that you leave throughout the night. You have nets that you need help. You know, you kind of um, put them in a square and catch them with a basket. You have different techniques. Um, and it really depends on the species. For example, new species, unfortunately, we have to take them to the lab and do x-rays and do DNA and do all of these analysis. Um, so you kind of have to um, put them to sleep and then preserve them and take them to the lab. But the big ones, we just take like a small um, thin clip. So thin clip, sorry. So you can have DNA sample and then you just put it back in the water. So it really depends on how well described or how big the fish is. But those are the two things. You either take a thin clip or you put them to sleep with clove oil oh. and then Lab. That's cool. We have some questions coming in from Mrs. Robinson class. Uh, when you're canoeing, do you meet local people? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so funny, funny story. The first expedition we did, we t it took us three weeks to see anyone. So the area is so remote and it's so cold next to the river that usually villagers tend to put their communities like five, six kilometers from the river. So it took us three weeks to see a single soul. <laughs> we had not seen anyone for three weeks. Um, but yes, there are several, not several, but a few communities along the system and they use the system for hunting, fishing, um, and also, of course, agriculture for cassava and potatoes and these things. Um, you do have some people that are very, very well knowledge with fish. They have their own traditional um, techniques to, to catch them. It's very sustainable in these remote areas. Uh, as you get towards towns, of course, it's not as sustainable. But they use these little um, handcrafted baskets. And even children use barks from trees to catch catfish. It's really fun to watch. And we have a specialist in fisheries, of course. And we have a specialist in um, in plants and they both came together to describe all of all of the different materials that are used all of the, the different techniques that are used so maybe we can learn with them as well and we can get species that we've never seen before wow that's incredible um, now what kind of other animals can you find other than the fish what else are you finding so this we've seen wild dogs we've seen so many hundreds of different birds, like a lot of different birds. Um, we have three new um, spider baboons. I love baboons, <laughs> uh, spider baboons. So I love spiders in general. So we have three new species of spider baboons, which are beautiful. Uh, you have dozens of different snakes. You have owenid snakes, you have pythons, you have uh, vipers, you have um, Boom slangs. Uh, of course, you have the big animals still. Um, we have a lot of camera trap pictures of them lions, cheetahs, leopards, um, warthogs. We have different big animals. Um, insects, many, 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 many hundreds of them. So many insects were caught that even the specialists are not able <laughs> to identify them yet to the full extent. They're only in a family level because there are so, so many insects. Um, but we have pretty much at least a hundred species for each of the biodiversity groups, which is a lot. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's amazing. Um, and now Vilcavango is a special place for uh, elephants. Why is that? Uh, the delta itself has half of the population of elephants in Africa or of African elephants in the world, actually. It is a special place because elephants search for water. 
So in places like the Okavango Delta, so the Okavango Delta is in the middle of the Kalahari Desert. So it's a desertic place. There's very, very little places where elephants can find water. They migrate for long, long distances just because of that, just because of getting water to survive, of course. So the Okavango Delta is very special because all of the elephants in the area gather around there when it's dry season because it's the only place where they can find water. So that makes the whole system, including Angola, very important because that is where the water comes from. Mm -hmm. So Angola has thousands of rivers. <laughs> I'm not even joking. We have thousands and thousands of rivers. Our whole country is a massive, <laughs> intricate system of rivers. But they're all related. So you do have elephants traveling from one side to the other once the flow shifts um, from one part of the system to the other. So it's, a, it's a very important for their migration routes um, in general. Let's see a question here. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. For your speech from everything. Just the old tents. <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we all sleep in our tents. Um, it's our home. When you're four months in a, in a tent, it feels like home. Um, the secret is how to react when you know an animal is around. Sorry, for example, if you know a lion is right next to your tent, you just keep quiet. You just you pretend you're not even breathing. You just keep quiet and, and just enjoy the experience. <clears throat> but all other animals are actually quite relaxed when you're inside a tent. You have elephants that can come and scratch in your tent. You have hyenas trying to steal things, your pair of shoes outside the tent. Um, you have... Um, wild beasts and buffaloes just running around and kind of trying to get away from your tent so you, you just enjoy not to panic <laughs> <laughs> um i have another question from twitter this is kind of related what is the most difficult uh part of being on an expedition i think well every person has their own um difficult thing to cope with when you're in on expedition you, you are staying away from your family, from your friends, from your home, your bed, your favorite food, your pets. You're, stay, you're kind of staying away from everything that you know in your civilization life and kind of cutting it all and going into a tent, eating rice and beans pretty much every meal. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not easy. Everyone copes their different way, but everyone has something that they're, they miss the most. I miss... My pets a lot. <laughs> I have three dogs. For me, it's very difficult to stay four months away from you know something that you care for, that you take care of. Um, my parents, my family. It's very difficult because you don't have phone reception. You hardly have internet, um, and so just you're not able to keep in touch. Awesome. And then we have one last question from Twitter. Then we can open up the questions to the kids in the classrooms. Um, how many women are there on the team? Well, <laughs> officially there's me, <laughs> but um, in every expedition you always have one or two others coming and going. You always have one or two kind of going in and out of the expedition. In the first expedition that was the most difficult, the longest one, I had another girl from the film team and after the second month she was in and out for a week or two uh, which helped <laughs> and that's kind of the trend toward, um, towards um, the expeditions. Awesome, all right so we can go to Mrs. Lumley's class. If you guys have any questions you would like to ask, we can turn up your mic there. Okay, I told you. Uh, go ahead, Mara. What's the scariest thing that happened on your expedition? Ah, what's the scariest thing that happened on your expedition? I have plenty of stories of that. Let me, let me, let me think of what is the scariest. Um, well, I think, I'll choose the elef the hippo. So hippos are very grumpy. They're they're very scary and big and, and fat and grumpy. <laughs> um, they're very territorial, so they don't like any other animal, not just hippos. They don't like any other animal to come into their territory. And one thing that they do when they're scared, they go straight to the water. They just run and go straight to the water, and whatever is in the in the way, they're just run over whatever is in their way. <laughs> And it happened 
of this delta crossing in August that I happened to be in the way. <laughs> so I was inside the canoe and I was in the water. And so they, you have this really tall sedges and grasses and you can't see, sometimes you can't see what's around you. And so they, because they're really big, they're able to open paths in this grass. And so you can see there is a hippo path. But if you're far away, you don't see the opening of it. What happened is that the polar of my Mokoro, we heard it was a hippo, so we stopped to see where it was. And I happened to be literally in the exit of its path. And so I just looked and I saw this massive, I mean massive, hippo coming towards me. And I knew I wasn't going to, he wasn't going to stop. So I just kind of yelled to another team member and he grabbed the canoe and he pulled the canoe to him. And so I slide off, and as, as I was sliding off, the hippo just passed like five centimeters ahead of me and went straight into the pool. Wow. I was wow. shocking. Yeah, that was, that was, that was scary. <laughs> that was very scary. All right. But let's, usually, all right let's, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, Mrs. Robinson, do you guys have any questions? Jay can ask you a question. Ask it. Sure. Um, oh. Do you ever research outside of Africa? Did you hear the question? Yeah. Do you ever research outside of Africa? Well, okay. Uh, me specifically, so the team is, we have over 50 different scientists coming from literally everywhere around the world. Um, individually, myself, I've done my master's abroad, so I was able to do, invest. I did in Europe, I did in Central America, I did in the US, I did in South Africa, so I was very lucky in the ways that I had different institutions have me so I could do research with them and go to the field with them. And the same happens with most of the researchers in our team. So we're lucky that way. Awesome. All right. So now we can go to Trish West. Do you guys have any questions over there? Where's which one? Lost you. Yes. Do we have any questions over here? Mrs. Is this Mrs. West? Oh, can you guys hear us? No? That's okay. We can. Yeah. Hi. Do you guys have any questions you want to ask? Oh, we can't hear you guys. Maybe type your questions into the chat box because we can't hear you. <laughs> All right, so we'll jump to another question as you guys type that. Um, then we have the group BB1 blog. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Hi. Um, what is your most interesting part of your role on the team? Can you repeat the question? What is your most interesting part of your role on the team? Of my role on the team? Yes. Um, what, one thing that I really enjoy about what I do is that I'm not just an animal scientist, so I don't just work with fish. Uh, let me start with that. It is very important to describe a fish structure along a river because then you can understand how the underwater system works. So how the habitat changes, so how the water quality changes and how that influences other animals. For example, birds. birds some birds eat fish, so you can expect some specific species to live in where some specific fish species live as well. So you can have a full comprehension of the system just by studying fish, which is really cool. But another thing that I feel I'm very lucky and I feel it's quite important as well is that I work with people as well. I work with communities. So Angola has gone through a very long, very long history of civil war and only recently we got to come to peace. And so you have communities living in areas where they haven't seen visitors for 40 years and suddenly you come there with a smile and, and, and they're just so eager to, to meet people, to see people, to learn. And just being part of this whole system of uniting my country and, and helping these people while helping the system, I think it's, I think it's my favorite part of what I do in the project. Awesome, all right, so we'll go back to Trish West, let's see, we got you guys working. Can we hear you? 
He still can't hear you. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Um, yeah, we can't hear you guys. So unfortunately, just type your question into uh, the Google chat, and we'll have to you answer that way. I'm not sure why it's not working for you. Uh, but we can go back to Mrs. Lumley's class. Do you guys have another question you would like to ask? Yes. yes. Go ahead. What was your favorite part of the expedition? So what was your favorite part of the expedition? Great question. Um, so the first expedition, which was the biggest one, I think my favorite part was when we found uh, the waterfall. So we came across this huge eight meters tall waterfall that no one has ever heard of, and it doesn't even have a name. And while well, let's say that being in a canoe in a waterfall is is, is a bit anxious to come out of the canoe but it was really cool because it's really really interesting to see how this system changed like how the, the, the plants around changed and there was so many flowers and the river is all sandy all white 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 sand and in the in the waterfall you suddenly have rocks and it's it's just coming into a very different world and it was so unexpected and it was such a big surprise it was probably the most, my favorite part of the expedition so we have our question in from Trish West, which is, you mentioned that elephants travel from one area to another. How do they know where to go? One thing about animals is that pretty much everything they do is imprinted, imprinted in themselves. And of course, it's thought by their parents. So a mother will go along a path and elephants have an extremely good memory. It's, it's really, really, really good. They don't forget a rock that is on the way. So their mothers will teach their children and so forth and so forth and so forth. Uh, and so it goes through generations and, and it just imprints them. And of course, they also have their senses much more um, sharpened than ours. They can, they, you know, when it rains um, and it hits the, 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 the ground and you can smell, you know, the, that smell that comes from the, the wet soil and you know it's wet soil, you know there was water in there. They, they do certain tricks like this, where they can identify where to go through the humidity in the air, through smells, through memories, um, and, and it's, it's really great to see how they operate without maps and all of these things. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, now we'll go to Mrs. Robertson. Do you have another question? Mrs. Robertson's class. We're boys and girls. I just typed. We want to say a big thanks to you. Your expedition sounds so amazing and interesting. We can tell you love your research and animals. We think it's cool. You miss your dogs. Thank <laughs> <laughs> um, you. Um, you can go to any of our media um, pages, Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, and there's tons of pictures and tons of videos that you can follow through all of our adventures and all of our work, which is also very cool. Mm -hmm. The Instagram page is great. You guys can wave, okay? Bye! Bye. 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 Awesome. And then we have uh, Mrs. Plant's class asking, um, what way do you think your research has helped the most? Um, first of all, the rest of Angola doesn't know that this place exists. It's like a secret paradise that most people are not aware of. And me, with the research and with the team in general, I was able to show to my fellow Angolans that this amazing place is part of our territory and we should all help protect. But also, again, uh, with the communities. So the communities now have hope in improving their ways of life and that they have hope that the rest of Angola now knows of them and that they can be included back in the system. So it goes both ways. Awesome. Um, and then for this class, are you guys Mrs. Hayes' back? Class? No? You have a question? Did you always want a scientist? Did I always Did I all want to be a scientist? Yes. Did you always want to be a scientist? 
Well, that is a very good question from where I come from. <laughs> um, again, we, have a, we had a very long history, and so science is not something that is very usual for people to want to be. So in the country where I'm from, people usually want to be lawyers or economists or anything that is related to sitting in a desk and making considerably more money <laughs> than being a biologist. Um, so the society kind of imprints that on you and even though I've always loved nature I've always been in the been close to the ocean and I've always had a contact with animals let's say a, a better liking of animals than most people that I know it was never something that I really wanted to do because of that because it's not something that people tell you oh this is what you can do but when going through university, my parents actually supported me a lot in doing what I want to do. And the only thing that I could think of spending five years of my life, which by the way, our bachelor is five years. So spending five years of my life doing was with nature. And through it, I just found out that I was completely passionate about it. And, and then I decided that I want to be a scientist. And then I decided that I want to study um, the animals and everything that is related to nature. Uh, from then on and I've invested a lot of my time doing that. Awesome and our final question is for Mrs. Plant's class and it's does the Delta fully dry up and if so where do all the fish go? The Delta has areas where it completely dries up. It, can, it, it even has areas that do not see water or feel water or whatever the sand does <laughs> um, for years. You have, for example, the Boteti River, which we crossed last year, and it hadn't had water for five different years. Good thing for the fish is that they can swim upstream. So whenever it's kind of drying up, they just go to a different place and they just live there. Um, and of course, when it brings more water, they can reproduce more and so forth and so forth. Um, so they just respect the um, balance of the system and if it is less water, they'll make less eggs and, and so forth. That's awesome. Well, that brings us to the end of our hangout. Thanks for joining us. We definitely learned a lot about all your research and about the Okavango. Uh, once again, I definitely suggest you guys check out the Instagram for Into the Okavango and their other social media stuff because it's really amazing. Some of the photos and the research that you're doing is incredible. I'm going to unmute everyone's mics and you guys yell goodbye. Yell. goodbye. Go for it. Nice and loud. Bye, guys. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.